right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. We are so happy you're here today. My name is Angie. I'm going to be your host for today's program. In just a minute, I'll introduce you to our paleontology team member who's going to be our presenter for the day. Before I do, a couple of quick things to note. First of all, we're going to use the chat box today to answer questions. Um, you could ask us questions. Um, so use that chat box right now, if you haven't already, to share your name, this, the grade you're in, city state you're from. Um, we are excited that you're all here. If you have a question for us today, you can type it in the chat box at any time and I'll ask those as, as we can. The second thing to note is our presentation today is gonna be about 30 to 35 minutes. Um, so we are excited to have you here. With that, I'm gonna step off the camera and welcome Ellen Therese Lamb. Thanks so much for being Hi. with us today, Ellen. Thank you, Angie. Excellent. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Angie, and thank you, Elliot, and welcome to all of all of our students and all of our teachers. It sounds like we have students from across Montana and also throughout the United States. So I'm glad you're all here. So what Angie's going to show you first off are many of the parts and pieces of a paleohistology project. So we're going to go over and describe what those are in great detail. And then also you see some photo micrographs. And these are pictures taken under a microscope. Some of these are under the influence of polarized light, which we will also describe in detail a little bit later. The pictures that you're seeing that you just saw, and then the pictures behind me are all pictures of dinosaur bones various different bones in the body, vary from various dinosaurs of different ages and stages of growth. So we're going to go through and describe that process as well of making these thin section slides that'll get us to these photomicrographs. And we'll also examine um, what kind of questions we ask about dinosaurs that will initiate this whole process called paleohistology. All right. So paleohistology is the study of the microscopic structure of fossil material. Pa and I'm gonna just check in with Angie. Is my sound good and my location okay? You're great, okay. yeah. Very good. All right, so paleohistology is a very powerful tool used in paleontology to help us answer a whole variety of questions about ancient life on earth. Let's see, a paleohistology project could begin with a question such as, how old is this triceratops? We will begin the process with the intact full fossil, such as this triceratops horn. And we will end the process with a thin section slide. So I'll bring that up so you can see that close. This is a thin slice of fossil material, about as thin as a human hair when we're finished with processing. This is thin enough for light to be passed through it. And then I don't know if Angie can also show over here really yeah. quickly. Our next step is to take this thin section slide under a polarizing light microscope and examine the internal structure. So Ellen, that's a real piece of dinosaur bone in your hand? Exactly. This cool. is actually from this triceratops horn. Awesome. All right, excellent. So before we begin cutting things up, it's important to take a number of initial steps. The first one is to get permission for your project and make sure that you have correct permission to permanently alter the fossil. The next is to gather data from the fossil while it's in one piece. And then the next step is um, to then gather, um, huh, let's see, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the best way to approach this, if I wanna hold up pieces or not. Okay, I'll just tell you again, to uh, gather permission, get permission, gather data from the specimen, and then you are ready to make thin sections of your specimens. So I think I will show you in hand. So once we have that correct permission, we want to gather data such as photographs, CAT scans, we can do 3D scanning of a specimen. We'll also 
make drawings of our specimens before we begin. So we figure out how to put all the parts and pieces back together when we're finished. Then while the fossil is still intact, we'll make a replica. In some cases, we will replicate the entire fossil, as in this case with this Triceratops horn, which looks very real, <laughs> thanks to the excellent painting job done by some of my volunteers in the paleohistology lab. We can tell this is a cast by yellow. That's our code for when we return a cast to collections. In other cases, we will make a cast replica of just the part of the fossil that we're interested in making thin sections from. And to make this replica, we're going to produce something called a mold. And this is part of a two-part mold that's made of silicone and plaster. And that helps us make a very accurate, detailed replica of the fossil. Then we will use a plaster cradle such as this to accurately reposition all the pieces when we're finished. So this cast piece will be rejoined with this actual real Triceratops fossil. And I'll turn it so you can see the actual inside structure as opposed to the inside of this cast, which has some spacers. And the cast is the replica or the copy of the real bones. So exactly. In the, in the white part that you're holding, that's the copy. And the, exactly. and the one in your hand is the real this fossil. This is the real heavy right. <laughs> fossil. And once it's put back together, I'm gonna lean down here and do that. You're gonna see something in particular, and I wanna ask you why that may be. All right. So this plaster cradle was also made while the specimen was intact. And you're gonna see an open space in between the real bone and the cast piece. So maybe give some thought to why we would leave that open space when we put everything back together. Okay, now we're ready to begin uh, making our thin section slides. So we'll take the actual fossil material and we will embed it in plastic resin. And is that close enough? Yeah, you can even hold it a little see? closer to that even camera too. Closer? Okay. Yep, and that plastic resin is that clear um, area surrounding the fossil. Correct. Great. Yep. That plastic resin enables us to cut a, a very thin slice of fossil material and have it stay intact. And later in today's presentation, you will see me thin sectioning a specimen on the saw. That thin slice is then mounted onto a frosted glass slide with epoxy glue. And then I spend many happy hours grinding and polishing this full specimen, full wafer mounted to the slide down to that final thin section slide, which you saw earlier. So another question is to think about why do we mount it in plastic resin? And I'll check in with Angie as answers come in. And again, then this is our final thin section slide. Awesome. So we, Ellen Trace just asked us why we put that clear stuff around the fossil, that plastic resin. Why do you think when she is making this, this fossil really thin, why did she put clear stuff around it first? Go ahead and type your answers into that chat box. You can just take right. a guess. And excellent. So now we're ready to look at some dinosaur bones under the microscope. Great. All right. So Angie's bringing up the talk. Yeah, you are set. We can see your picture. Excellent. Yeah. And I'm not advancing. Right. So oh, no. Let's try it now. Excellent. Right. Fantastic. We have a few answers for you, Ellen. All right. And I'm going to get set up here. Great. So um, I'm reading off your guesses here that you typed in the chat box, and we think that you put the plastic resin around that fossil to protect it um, in case you drop it, Oh. Uh, to keep it safe, uh, to make it easier to cut. So 
so it doesn't break um, to keep the fossil more stable, also so it can fit into the slide. All great guesses, all great responses. Great job, everybody. Mm -hmm. I think all of those are accurate. Yes. <laughs> and the one um, that jumps out at me is the stability one. It really enables us to keep the very thin starting wafer um, small enough that we won't be grinding and polishing forever and in, at, in one piece when it's embedded in resin. If we were to try to cut unembedded bone that thin, we would have many <laughs> sections instead of just one wafer. All right, so I'm going to go through and get ready for our slideshow. Okay, so we can use paleohistology to study many forms of ancient life on Earth, and we can utilize many different kinds of fossil material. Today I'll be focusing on dinosaurs and on bones. But in addition to bones, researchers in paleontology can also look at other hard tissue types that fossilize well. And this is another thing to think about. In living animals today, if one were to be preserved and fossilized, what other body parts do you think might fossilize? So we look at fossilized bone, as in this Tyrannosaurus rex rib, which is very well preserved. We can also look at ossified tendon. We can look at eggshell and we can examine dinosaur teeth. So we are presenting today from the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. And then I heard some of you are from Montana and some are from other places in the United States. So maybe let us know if you've ever been here to the Museum of the Rockies. If you've been to the Museum of the Rockies, go ahead and type yes in the <laughs> chat box. Excellent. Oh, you do. We have quite a few folks. Excellent. And a few knows also. Oh, okay. <laughs> awesome. We're so glad that a lot of you have been able to join us. And if you haven't, maybe you can come see us someday in the future. That would be wonderful. You're going to get a peek at some of the things we have on display here. So um, that'll be an excellent thing to look for when you come here and visit in person. So paleohistology has a long history at the Museum of the Rockies and behind all of the research revealed today is a primary investigator who asked a question in paleontology and used paleohistology as a tool for discovery. Our research is now led by Dr. John Scanella, who is our J.R. Horner Curator of Paleontology. John was a doctoral student of J.R. or Jack Horner who led our paleo department here at the MOR for over 35 years. And I too have been here at the Museum of the Rockies for a long time, 30 years in fact. I grew up in New Jersey and I could be found outside whenever possible. I first set my sights on Montana when I was six years old and I first saw pictures of Glacier National Park. And I also loved going to my father's laboratory when I was a kid. There's a picture of my father down here on the bottom of the slide in the middle. He's here at the Museum of the Rockies outside in front of Big Mike. He studied pharmacology and he helped develop drugs to aid in the um, healing of the diseases of the heart and lungs. He greatly supported my love of all things scientific. And here I am at age 10 um, with my first microscope. I studied pre-veterinary medicine and forestry and wildlife at Rutgers University in New Jersey. And I came out to Montana the very first time to study wolves in Glacier Park. So in that bottom right hand corner, you are seeing um, actual prints of one of the first wolf packs to come down from Canada and then in the lower, uh, what we call the lower 48 of the United States. Ellen Therese, you said you had a microscope when you were 10 years old. I yes. bet we have some 10 year olds listening in today. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if any of you have gotten a chance to look through a microscope. Oh, that's a great if question. So, type it into that chat box, mm -hmm. let us know. Yes, and now there are wonderful ones that are just built off of a camera and you can take your microscope pictures and take them right into your computer. So 
that would be wonderful. Let us know if you have any of those or it would be a great birthday or Christmas present in the future. So just like me, my daughter um, spent many days of her childhood in the laboratory right here in the paleontology department of the Museum of the Rockies. She has recently graduated from Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. And she will serve as my first example of ontogeny, the study of the growth and development of an individual over time. So here's Rebecca at her first dinosaur dig up in the upper left, uh, outside Shoto, Montana at Egg Mountain. In the middle, she is outside of the Museum of the Rockies when Big Mike, the bronze T-Rex in front of our museum was actually being put up. And then here she is in the bottom right. Um, here we are together where she's all grown up. So Rebecca's going to serve as your first clue for something I'm going to show you in just a bit. Okay, now back to dinosaurs. This painting by Doug Henderson shows two extreme examples of duck-billed dinosaur development. An attentive myosaur parent with its nestling myosaur babies. This will be your second clue for the next part of the presentation. So keeping ontogeny, the growth and development of an individual and uh, myosaurus in mind, I wanted to show you a number of photomicrographs without telling you at first what you're seeing. And I will identify these fully at the end of the presentation. All right, and we're going to work our way through them one more time. So we can just get a quick visual. on that one for a moment while I catch up over here. Oh yeah, we've got some great guesses as to what everybody thinks we're looking at. Okay, excellent. Yeah. So keeping those images in mind, next we're going to talk about some basic terminology in bone anatomy. In long bones, thin section slides are often produced from the diaphysis you can see that word on the left hand side of the bone there, or the long central shaft of the bone. This compact bone, which surrounds the medullary cavity, often holds the best record of an animal's skeletal development. So that's just the first word and the general idea of a long bone that I wanted to give you. Now looking inside, deeper inside of the bone, at a transverse slice or cross section of compact bone, numerous osteons are shown. So that's another word I wanna to introduce to you today. Osteons are the building blocks of bone and are long columns of layered bone embedded with bone cells surrounded by blood vessels. And you can see on the left an osteon sort of jutting out of this excellent drawing of a thin section, a cross section of bone what all the different microanatomy looks like. And it may look somewhat like what you just saw. So now in this photograph, which you have seen, you can identify the bone structures, numerous osteons in a dinosaur bone. That whole series of slides I showed you, we're gonna come back to in a little bit, but first we're gonna talk about some techniques. So keep them in mind as well, because there's more to be revealed. So let's see, um, we're gonna take a deeper look at three techniques that I mentioned, sectioning and restoration and polarized light. So Angie's gonna press go.
excellent. And I can show you, I still have all 10 figures. <laughs> so I was actually producing a wafer of embedded bone and cutting it using a tile saw with what we call a continuous rim diamond blade. Diamond is what you need to actually cut dinosaur bone because it's so hard once it's fully mineralized. Why was there water on that saw? Oh, good question. So there's water and there's actually a little cooling fluid in the water as well. So that helps cool the saw, cool the saw and lubricate the cut. Great question. Excellent. Yeah, the plastic would melt and the metal would start to bend. So that keeps everything at the best temperature for that really, really rapid, rapid um, uh, revolutions of that saw and um, quick cutting of the specimen. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about restoration. Put it back the way you found it is an important part of our process. And we are known from, from around the world for doing a great job in putting histology specimens back together. This is Baker trike and a middle section of its horn was removed for histology with a painstakingly painted cast uh, created and put back in place of the specimen that we removed. We had quite a time getting the fit just right. We used that very large plastic plaster cradle you can see behind and a lot of vet wrap in the process. In the end, we finally had success and then this specimen will be going on display. So if you're here at the Museum of the Rockies, this will be one to look for soon. And next, microscopy. All right. So to image thin section slides, such as these Allosaurus slides, polarized light microscopy is most useful. Thin sections of both modern and fossilized bone are birefringent. This means that polarized light waves being transmitted through the specimen will divide and split as they pass through the sample, as opposed to remaining unaltered. This is a schematic of a basic polarized light microscope. So a polarizer is placed under the specimen and an analyzer above. So imagine the polarizer and the analyzer resembling window slats with many, many openings, um, like a Venetian blind. They are then rotated at 90 degrees relative to one another or crossed. This crossing blocks out all the light waves that travel through the first polarizer effectively darkening the whole image. When a birefringent sample is placed in the light path between these two filters, the light waves are divided or split depending on the composition and thickness of the material. And therefore they reach the analyzer at different levels. This light condition produces patterns of light and dark within the specimen and can also produce those wonderful colors you saw um, if we use something called wave plates to bend and manipulate the um, final waves coming through the specimen even further. So I'd like to say, since we cannot stain dinosaur bone as the biological remains that would be in modern bones, such as proteins and antibodies have decayed in almost all conditions, not all, but almost all conditions with fossilized material, then we can use polarized light to stain the bones. So Ellen Therese, is it correct that it's the special microscope that you have that's making the, the colors that we can see in the pictures behind us? Yeah, it's the light condition that a polarized light microscope can create by having a polarizer and an analyzer create a polarized light um, stream you place your specimen in that light path, and then you'll get the light and dark. Awesome. The colors are then introduced by using something called a wave plate. I can pull mine out of the microscope and hold it up. You can see it over here. Mm -hmm. Great. So this wave plate then further changes the, the angle of receipt of the, the wave before it comes to your eye. And then instead of just light and dark patterns, it actually changes it to a whole variety of colors, 
again, depending on how thick your specimen is and what minerals make up your specimen. Out. And at the very end, I'm going to share with you a link to our lab website. And on our homepage, we have a great video about how polarized light works. Okay, let's get ready to look again at that series of photomicrographs you viewed earlier. Okay, little introduction to the location that they came from. Outside Shoto, Montana is a vast deposit of Cretaceous age sediments that preserve the remains of an incredible nesting ground used repeatedly by the duckbill dinosaur Myasaura. On display here at the MOR is a remarkable growth series of Myasaura leg bones from this site. And I do believe we have students from Shoto listening in today. So oh, special excellent. hello to Shoto. Oh, okay. So you guys can tell us because um, there was a number of years and now on and off over time, um, people are able to go to this actual locality and get a daytime tour yeah. of Egg Mountain. So yeah. let us know if they are. They're, they're saying there. hi. Hi, Shoto. Yay. We've got quite a few students coming. <laughs> Excellent. Well, fossil and geological evidence from this locality showed that Myasaur traveled in family groups, which allowed many ages of the same dinosaur to be preserved all in one place. The high number of fossils in this locality was most likely preserved as the result of extreme volcanic activity. So the photomicrographs you viewed before were showing you dinosaur bone growth right before your eyes. In the hatchling and nestling Myasaura, calcified cartilage is well preserved and identified by the stacked columnar structures. Here's a view at higher magnification of calcified cartilage surrounding an area of primary bone growth that's just beginning to form. As bone matures in this nestling Myasaura, the pattern goes from highly vascular as the animal is rapidly growing showing by the lighter open areas where the blood supply would be, to a more dense pattern as in this juvenile. The vascularity or the blood supply per area of tissue is decreasing and primary bone tissue is beginning to mature and form those osteons that we talked about earlier. Again, they are multi-layered columns of concentric bone matrix embedded with cells that surround blood vessels. In this subadult Myasaura, the increasing density of bone tissue is very apparent. The vascular canals are still present and numerous, just not as open in this section. Here, osteons are developing as this bone begins to remodel, a process of erosion and deposition, erosion and deposition that goes on in the skeleton throughout a dinosaur's lifetime and ours as well. Lags or lines of arrested growth are also evident in this image and can mark individual years in life of the dinosaur. Here in the adult bone, numerous osteons are seen and the level of remodeling of osteons can also help us determine the age of an animal. And again, so can lines of arrested growth. I included this extra picture here where lags can be clearly seen. There's three of them, and this time it's in a T-Rex. So they are the dark lines that bracket areas of bone deposition. The area between two lags can represent a year in the life of a dinosaur. Lags can be counted and measured to determine the growth stage and approximate chronological age of an animal. So a question for you, where else in nature may you have seen lags or something in either a plant or animal that indicates its age. I've got some guesses already. So type into that chat box, uh, these legs, those lines that form kind of some rings inside of our bones. What do those remind you of? Okay, let's yeah. see if other rings come to mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so to close, let's take a, a look at some other specimens we have in our dinosaurs under the big sky exhibits, which some of you may have seen and hopefully some of you will see in the future. Okay, so featured 
in our hall of horns and teeth is a remarkable ontogenetic series of dinosaur skulls displaying the maturation of the Cretaceous dinosaur Triceratops. So in addition to growth evidence in long bones, we also know that skulls of many dinosaurs radically changed as they matured into adulthood, with histology helping us to determine what chronological age or stage of development that these changes occurred. For example, the horns of these triceratops change in direction as the animal matures. So another question, knowing that most of the group is between fourth and eighth grade, what may have been changing in your skull over the last couple of years that could give an indication of your age or your stage of growth? So we'll see, Angie, if we get any answers on that. Yeah. So what is what changes in your skull as you grow? We're looking at some triceratops right now mm -hmm. and how they change. What changes mm -hmm. in your own skull and a human skull? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have brain, teeth, our bones. Keep guessing. Let's mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. What's some hair? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, hair's good too. Yep, that's teeth. actually, yes, that's an excellent indicator. Yep, we do have to wear masks. That has changed on our, <laughs> on our skulls this year, hasn't it, Alan? That can be an indicator, yeah, indication of that, uh, yeah. Of what year we're in, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, teeth, noses, teeth. chin, mm -hmm. uh, thickness, the thickness of our skull, our mm -hmm. face changes, our eyes change. Mm -hmm. Right, because we have sutures that come together and fuse mm -hmm. from infanthood on and then changes that'll happen, de decreasing in bone density. So that can be a factor in aging. And I was thinking particularly about teeth, but you guys came up with some excellent, excellent other ideas. Okay, we're gonna look again at another aspect of Triceratops as we wrap up here. The shield on the back of the skull of Triceratops changes dramatically as well, ultimately ending up with two large openings in the parietal bones. This specimen was studied by John Scanella for his PhD thesis examining Triceratops and Taurosaurus. Polarized light helped reveal the primary tissue layer of this parietal bone, shown in orange, as well as the extreme remodeling that was occurring, shown in yellow and green. In the case of Triceratops, with the solid frill or parietal shield, and Taurosaurus, the one with the holes in its frill, the extreme remodeling of the bone tissue supported John's hypothesis that Taurosaurus was actually a fully mature Triceratops and not a separate species. So today we focus primarily on dinosaur ontogeny. However, paleohistology can reveal the answers to many questions about ancient life on Earth. And when you visit the Museum of the Rockies, you can learn more about dinosaur diseases, reproduction, defense, and parent parenting, and more, <laughs> all through paleohistology. So I want to quickly thank my colleagues at the Museum of the Rockies and my great paleo volunteers and students who helped make a lot of this happen. And then to find out more, you can visit our Museum of the Rockies website. And then also, I want to make a special thank to, thanks to the primary investigators of John R. Horner, John Scanella, and Holly Woodward. They are the researchers of both the Triceratops and Myasaura projects that I showed in today's presentation. And more in-depth information about all of their research, as well as a video on polarized light and articles about Triceratops versus Taurosaurus, and also a link to a wonderful PBS show called Prehistoric Road Trip can all be found on our um, Histology Lab website. So the URL is right there and we'll share that through Angie and through the instructors. Is that easy to do? Sure, excellent. So through that site, you can scroll through and find lots of more information about paleohistology and what we do here at the Museum of the Rockies. And at Prehistoric Road Trip, you can watch videos that actually were filmed down in the laboratory and out in the field 
um, for numerous paleontologists in this area of the country, as well as the Museum of the Rockies. So that, I think, is my close. Great. So thank you again to Streamable Learning and Angie and everybody for attending today. And we have a few moments for any yeah. final questions or answers to some of the questions that I asked. Yeah, great. I think we have time for just maybe one question. Um, Ms. Mendenhall's class was wondering how long Triceratops lives. Oh, great question. And that's a John Scanella question. That is what he's researching right now. And he is actually examining two things that you saw today. So we've got Triceratops in a whole variety of ages from just a few years old, you know, upwards to 20 years. We think biologically, especially a lot of the larger dinosaurs could have lived a very, very long time, but the lifestyle <laughs> and the stresses of living and procuring food and defense may have taken them out earlier than their ultimate lifespan could have been. Um, but stay tuned with uh, John and Holly Woodward are working together on some upcoming research to answer that question. And we're actually doing histology of the horns and histology of the limbs and comparing all of that data to try to sort out in our collection of triceratops how old they are as they mature to adults and now how old some of our oldest specimens are. Great. Well, that is all the time we have for today. We have um, quite a few questions we didn't get to answer. So um, if we uh, didn't get to your questions, send us an email to moroutreach at montana.edu. It's right in your chat box. I will pass that along to Ellen Terry Slam and our volunteers, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. Uh, Ellen, thanks again so much for joining us. Everybody, thanks for tuning in today. Have a great rest of your day.